sister, as husband and wife. Now you want to establish or continue the same relationship on the other side. But at the resurrection, since everybody is resurrected instantaneously, you know, simultaneously, same time, then the seven brothers waking up one time and they see this woman, then everybody will be going after her. You see? He says, this is mine, I had her. The other guy says, it's mine, I had her. Everybody had her. And everybody will be fighting over this one woman as wife. And there'll be war in heaven between the seven brothers. This is mine, this is mine. You know, where you come from? He says, I had her. Because they won't remember the other guys having her before them. You see? So they want to know from Jesus which guy is going to have her on the other side. Because they all had her here. In answer to that, Jesus says, He says, neither shall they die anymore. Meaning that once they are resurrected, they will be immortalized. Neither shall they die anymore. They will be immortalized. In other words, the things that kill a person, lack of food, shelter, clothing, rest, these things will not be necessary on the other side. Once you die, you do not die a second time. No more death. Immortalized. This is a physical body which has got its physical needs. Food, shelter, clothing, sex, rest. That body, no food, no shelter, no clothing, no sex, no rest of the type that we know. It will be of some kind, other kind, spiritual kind, but not this kind. So he says, neither shall they die anymore. For they are equal unto the angels. In other words, they will be angelized. They'll have spiritual bodies like angels. What kind of bodies they have? Not this. For they are equal unto the angels. They'll be angelized. They will be spiritualized. They will have spiritual bodies. They will be spirits. For they are equal unto the angels and the children of God. For such are the children of the resurrection. Such spirits. They will be such spirits. Paul says spirits. Jesus says spirits. I wonder if there is a single person here who takes exception to that. He says it will be this body. Is there one here in the Royal Albert Hall in front of some 6,000 people in London, I posed the question and there was not a single Muslim or Christian who could t take exception to these axiomatic truths that resurrection, in that, at that time, your bodies will be spiritualized. Paul says so, Jesus says so, I say so, and you say so. So he says the spirit has no flesh and bones. In other words, I'm not what you are thinking. You are thinking that I've come back from the dead. That is not so. I'm not resurrected. And yet the whole Christian world, they say that he died and he was resurrected. The man says, I am not what you are thinking and eating broiled fish and honeycomb. These are the needs of this physical body. But somehow, you see, people get programmed. I was talking about people getting brainwashed. At the Berkeley University in 1977, I was talking to the my American people, some teachers and students, and I said, you people are brainwashed. So one professor stood up, he says, I beg your pardon, we are programmed. I said, right, programmed. <laughs> Not brainwashed. So we all get programmed. See, from childhood, because our salvation depends on this, that we must believe that Christ died and was resurrected. But resurrection is spiritual, spiritual. And we find that everything about Jesus after his post crucifixion events, not once does he appear to be a spirit. He is ever in hiding. He is ever in hiding. He never came out into the open. He never went to the temple of Jerusalem. He had given the Jews a sign. He never went to fulfill that sign. Sign means a miracle. To say, look, you remember what I told you? Here I am. Do, what you, do your worst. But he didn't dare do anything. He didn't dare to go to meet these people, the Jews, his own people. He had given them a sign. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, 39, 40, we read there, again, the same type, type of uh, confrontation. The Jews come along, and they said, Master, again, in the Hebrew language, Rabbi, 
we would have a sign of thee. In other words, we want you to show us a miracle, to convince us that you are above the ordinary. You are the man we are waiting for, the Messiah. Do something like flying in the air, like a bird, walk on the water, give life to the dead, do something, man. Then we know that you are above the ordinary. So that we can believe that you are our Messiah. In response to that, Jesus says to his people, he said, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. As a horrible nation, horrible people. You're looking for miracles, tricks. It's tricks to convince you that I'm a genuine man of God. You want me to show you some tricks? Magic? He said, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. But there shall no sign be given unto it. No sign, no miracle. Except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Only one. None but one. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man, referring to himself, be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. This is the only sign I'm prepared to give you. The only miracle I'm prepared to concede to is this. He didn't say, you know, blind Bartimaeus, I healed him. You know that woman with issues, bleeding profusely for years. She touched me and she got healed. You know, I brought up Lazarus back from the dead. You know that girl, she had died and I brought her back. You know that fig tree, I destroyed it from its very roots. You know I killed those 2,000 pigs. You know I turned water into wine. Nothing. Nothing of the kind. He never showed any of these things. He says, look, look back, look back, man, what I have done so far. Said, mm. The only sign I'm prepared to give you is the sign of Jonah. What happened to Jonah is going to happen to me. His miracle is my miracle. And I have been asking these missionaries of Christendom, these hot gospelers, these Bible thumpers, evangelists, preachers, I said, now, what was that sign? He said, the, my sign is the sign of Jonah. I said, what was that sign? And believe me, in 40 years, no Christian worth the name has ever come forward to tell me what was that sign. I said, did he fulfill it? He said, yes. I said, what? How? Speechless. Of course, our doctor, Robert Douglas, may be better prepared. He might know all these things beforehand. He's a missionary, you know, in the Middle East, among the Muslims has been, and he's somebody big in the Zwemer Institute, he might have the answer. But I will give it to you. In case he fails, so I might as well give it to you beforehand. What was the sign? I said, look, to get the sign, to know what was the sign of Jonah, you have to go to the book of Jonah in the Bible. And that book of Jonah is one page. This is the page. Four short chapters, one page. So if you go to the book of Jonah, it won't take you two minutes. It won't take you two minutes to read this book. This whole book, it won't take you two minutes. So we read there that Jonah was sent to the Ninevites. God Almighty commands him, go to Nineveh and warn the people that they must repent and in sackcloth and in ashes, humble themselves before the Lord. Otherwise, I will destroy the people. Jonah, a prophet of God, but he is human, he feels despondent, he said, these materialistic people, they will not hearken to the message, they will make a mockery out of me, as Jesus described them, a wicked and adulterous generation, this wicked and adulterous generation of Jonah's time, they are going to make a mockery of him, so he says, instead of going to Nineveh to warn the people, he goes to Joppa and takes a boat and is running away to Tarshish. You don't have to remember the names. He, instead of going to one direction, he goes in the opposite direction and is running away. At sea, there is a storm. And according to the superstitions of these people, whosoever runs away from his master's command, deserts his duty, calls for such punishment. So they began to question, who can be responsible for this havoc? Because the storm is not abiding is not subsiding. So Jonah, he realizes that he's the guilty person because actually he's running away from his master's command. God tells him to go to Nineveh and he's going to Joppa. As a soldier of God, he had no right to do things preserved.